All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all today. And we had a, a good evening in Las Vegas last night. I am Nancy Lowe. I am a professor here in the College of Education at UNLV. Um, I am the director of the Intercollegiate Professional Court Management Graduate Program, as well as director of the Intercollegiate, I'm sorry, um, Innovation Institute, um, Sport Innovation Institute here at UNLV. Um, my research is to focus on the economic value of women's sport and marketing sport to women. Um, in 2019, I published a book on the handbook of the business of women's sport, personal design. And I'm joined today by colleagues that I work closely with um, in the research space. So to my left is Dr. Jada Mumsu. She's the Gearing Endowed Professor and Department Chair at Sport Management at the University of New Haven. Um, Jada is an expert in fan behavior, sport marketing, women's sport marketing, media representation of female athletes, and marketing analytics. She was the first to author a textbook in sport analytics, and she's also uh, one of the first to co-author a study on marketing sport to LGBTQ fans. And to her left is Dr. Nicole Lavoy, who is director of the Tucker Center for Research on Girls and Women in Sport at the University of Minnesota. She's a leading scholar on women coaches, and um, her seminal research you may be familiar with includes the Women in Coaching Report Card. So this report card is issued annually on Division I, all NCAA Division I programs. For those of you that are international, that's our highest, most competitive level of collegiate sport. And this report card basically gives institutions in A through F grade um, based on how many head coaches of women's sport they have. And I believe the, the range has gone all the way from two to maybe seven this year A's, which means the vast majority of schools get a B or a C and a lot of D's and F's, um, which is the reason that this research is so um, important. And it's longitudinal and it's been going on for 11 years now. So it is beginning to make an impact because we, Dr. Dr. Lavoie can tell you she has ADs who will call them because they're unhappy with their grade, <laughs> um, which means, you know, hey, time to do better, time to hire more women um, for coaching women's sport. And um, Dr. Lavoie is also the um, author of the groundbreaking book, Women in Sport Coaching and has a new program with Nike called Coaching Her that is going to have a global impact on how to coach girls and women in sport. So that's our, our panel for today. Um, I want to start us off, give you just a little bit of context. Uh, we became a research team back during COVID, a little bit before COVID. And really what we, and you'll, you'll hear a little bit more about the rest of our team here in a minute, um, what we realized was that the narrative around women's sport was something that needed to change. And in order to change the culture of women's sport, we needed to help change the story. And as my colleague on my far left likes to say, we have to let data tell the story. Um, the old model for what works for mainstream sport, you all are very familiar with, you probably never thought about it all that much. We think about it in the business world a lot. But in essence, the sport of the athlete is what drives the media coverage. That's the beginning of the cycle. The media coverage, whether it's print, television, you name it, is what drives the value that tells companies like sponsors, advertisers, that they want to get engaged right, by investing. That investment is responsible for what we call brand equity developing the brand equity of the athlete, the team, the league, all of that. That then drives us right back to the athlete, the sport, the team, and the media coverage. Problem is, it's well-established, well-recognized, well-researched that the percent of media coverage that women's sport gets is right around 4%. So 96% of the media coverage is going to tell us that, women's, or that men's sport matters and you should watch it and you should go to it, you should consume it. Therefore, the sponsors invest heavily in men's sport, right? 
Therefore, the brand equity of male athletes, sport teams, leagues continues to grow exponentially. And on we go around again in the circle, right? Well, it was very clear to us that this is simply not working for women's sport. Been tried, right? We have 27 years now in the WNBA. Hasn't been working. Those of you the International League, Women's National Basketball Association, the equivalent of the NBA, but it is far younger for one, right? 27 years compared to 75 years. Um, but more importantly, it's not working. But something was happening during COVID. The National Women's Soccer League had a 490% increase in viewership during COVID. The National Women's Soccer League eclipsed engagement in viewership of NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, the NHL. Something was happening. Similarly, the WNBA had exponential growth during this period of time and is continuing to do so. So we recognized these indicators and the data that was coming out and said, there's a different model going on here. What's happening? And so that's the work that we went for is to try to identify and begin to educate people about the new model that is driving women's sport. And so with that, I'm gonna let my colleague, Dr. Lavoie talk about our research team and the goals that we started out with. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. So before I start about our research team, um, for those of you that may not have ever heard about the Tucker Center for Research on Girls and Women's Sport at the University of Minnesota, I would just invite you to put it in your notes to go on the website, check it out, tuckercenter.org. And there's a lot of very good evidence-based key resources on our website. So including the disruptors report, that's free. So everything that we produce in the Tucker Center as a land grant public institution, we offer for free. So back to our team, part of the team is here this morning. Um, as the director of the Tucker Center, it's really important to me and one of my values as a scholar is that what we do is public facing. So yes, I do research, I publish in journals, a couple people read it, maybe nobody does, I don't know, except for my students where I assign them to read it, they have to. Um, but I've really been more interested in being a public scholar. How do we produce information that's accessible and free and makes a difference? So when we do research in the Tucker Center, the end, we start with the end. What is the social problem? And how do we get data to fix the problem? And then how do we disseminate it to those who need it? So this disruptors project that we're talking about today was born out of Nancy and I talking about women's sport, as we do a lot and thinking about the problem is this old model of sport isn't working and we need to change the narrative. So we started developing a team with our colleagues in different areas of gender and sports scholarship. So um, we built a dream team. So, well, I would like to call it I mean, I'm on it, so I guess I would say, like, I can call it what I want. So we're the dream team, and myself, who sits at the intersection of sports sociology, sports psychology, gender, um, coaching science, so I have a lot of different areas that kind of come together. And then what Nancy was saying is her expertise is sponsorship, and her Data, data analytics, but we brought in our colleagues, Ann Pigarero and Katie LaBelle. At, um, they're both at Guelph now. Katie was at Ryerson, they're in Canada. Um, Katie has a background in merchandising. So this idea that, you know, if you want to go buy gear for women's sport, where do you find it? It's always sold out, which is like, what did you make three shirts? I mean, what? why can't we find the merchandise? And then um, Anne is around social media. And then my colleague at the University of Minnesota, uh, Dunia Antunovich, does communications and media. So we all have different areas of expertise. And we started meeting once a week during COVID. 
then, you know, because we needed something to do and we would have these conversations and born out of those conversations was we need to write a new paper that captures what's happening in the landscape of sport for women. And we landed on just loved hers. That was quite a clever hashtag. And I would invite you to use it. Um, and we wanted to make the case with data, because we let data tell the story that women's sport is a viable entity. And we need to change how we market, promote, sponsor, et cetera, women's sport. And here's the starting point. So that is sort of the introduction to disruptors and our team, because um, we really feel strongly that we want to bridge the gap between academics. How many of you in the room are like at academic institutions? Okay. Um, how many of you would say you're in industry? Any couple in industry? Okay. So we learned with this project, and this is no mystery to any of you perhaps, but there's a big gap between higher ed and industry. And we all do research, but we do research in very different ways. So we wanted to bridge that gap. So that's a little bit about disruptors and the, the evolution of our team. And the really the goals of the disruptors was to produce something that we could disseminate widely, which it has been. And then we wanted to disrupt inaccurate narratives around women's sport. And if you think about maybe let's take 30 seconds, turn to your partner somewhere next to you and talk about what are what do you hear about women's sport? What do people say about women's sport? And there's no right or wrong answer. So just discuss with somebody. <laughs> Of our society, and I think back on 
there is for the new schools in the wall, but it is right of course for the women's sports as well. Uh, some of the things that we recognize that were similar or ongoing gender role and some restrictions there, but we are both looking ongoing um fights the overcome those challenges, right? So we're seeing that we NBA for the fighting for reproductive rights. Health care, we are seeing um, West Women's National Team fighting for equal pay. And these are some of the very few examples that um, come to mind immediately. With those, we also have seen very large generational shifts, right? So when we look at the original uh, design of the sport industry, that was put together over the time based on the British Roman and Patriots, right? So, but when we look at different cultural worlds, we certainly realize that. Different cultural worlds behave in different patterns. And Gen Z certainly doesn't behave like the boomers. And they make up 40% of the consumer uh, base or the population. Collectively, when we look at baby boomers, uh, Gen Z and millennials, they have $350 billion purchasing or spending power in the US alone. So that is telling you probably 40% of um, the audience for the consumer base with a large spending power. We can't be ignored in the market. And they have completely different behavior patterns, including and relating to some of the um, value based decision making and purchasing behaviors. The largest piece of uh, change we see in the industry or the society is digital disruptions. You probably all recognize in your own behaviors or perhaps your students or your children, anyone, everyone around you, people live on their phones, right? So our lives are very digitized right now and our behaviors are very different. And that went on to actually disrupt that cyclic um, industry structure where we have to rely on linear media. We no longer have to do that, right? So digitization of the lives actually opened up a variety of tools, variety of mediums, and bringing us and women's sports 20 different opportunities to reach beyond. And uh, two other things, this actually spurred the interest from uh, the sponsors. Obviously, we can tie that back to the value-driven consumption of Gen Z and millennials, and related to that, the societal change in the narratives collectively uh, attracted more sponsors and media coverage and accessibility of women's sports are certainly coming together, bringing a solid recognized model for women's sports. And on top of this, we have certainly seen the popularity of women athletes and how they actually attract audience. There's interest in them. And we can, in fact, present this with data and say, Women athletes have better engagement rates than men when you consider their audience base. So what we are saying is a WNBA player may have a better engagement rate than LeBron James. I said that on the record. <laughs> <laughs> and LeBron James, the king, we're, we're from Cleveland, formerly from Cleveland, Cleveland. Well, formerly. Right, he, he might, I don't know, 10 million followers, and Candace Parker, one of the aces, might have a million followers, but her million followers are much more engaged, stay on it, follow it, share it, retweet it, than the 10 million followers of the king. Yeah, and I, I like to use Candace Parker because she's an aces player now. Um, she will be sure to thank you all. Um, but um, I like to use Candace Parker also as an example of changing values because she actually has a TED talk. And on that TED talk, she talks about her daughter. She has a daughter who's a, a young teenager who came to her one day with a list of companies and said, Mom, these are the companies that we can no longer purchase from. And Candace is like, okay, what, what's up? Why, why can't we do that? And she said, well, these, these companies do not embrace um, body image for women, like, you know, the differences in, in how women should be represented to really, really demonstrate the variety of, of body images. They're more into like body shaming kind of images. And so we just cannot buy from them anymore. And she said, okay, that's fine. So what that, what that tells you is really how the changing values of Gen Z millennials and the generation coming after them is influencing consumption in a very big way, a very big way. Their values are what decide or help them decide what decisions they're gonna make around purchasing, 
right? And this is happening in sport as well. So the case of the WNBA being, you know, very um, social justice oriented and messages around social justice, they were the ones to do that first. And it has resonated well with their fan base, right? Because these are things that their fan base actually cares about. That isn't necessarily as easily done for some of the men's um, sport leagues. I know we had some presentations on that yesterday, but that's one of the distinctions, right? We can't just treat women's sport like we do men's sport and assume it's all the same. It simply is not. And that's a great point of differentiation right there. Want to talk about another one? Jada? Yeah, um, I'll just jump on that just really quickly. Like, what we are trying to build a body of knowledge, us and other of our colleagues, is how do we get the data to show what fans of women's sport are doing and their values, and what are women's sport fans doing? So that's two different things. And oftentimes it gets kind of rolled up in one because people assume, well, fans of women's sport are all women, which is not true. Then some of the men in the room probably are fans of women's sport, but we don't know a lot about fans of women's sport or women's sport fans. And so this is, again, trying to build that case for delineating what we know about these two important groups. Yeah, one of the biggest problems, I mentioned that I, I published a book on the Handbook of Women's Sport, and the reason is I did that because it didn't exist, right? The research on, as, as Nicole just said, the research on women's sport and on women's sport in general, um, from a business perspective in particular, has just been lacking, right? Any of the studies that we've had historically have been a comparison, right? Like women's sport to men's sport and how, you know how that works. It's like, well, the model is men's sport and therefore women's sport is always the secondary um, that that kind of a perspective. So that's another goal that we have is to prompt more research and demonstrate where the need is for research. Um, but what are the, the outcomes of this for the new model? There's three things that we saw in disruption, three major takeaways. One, changing values, which we just talked about. Two, athlete agency, which Jay is going to talk about a little bit more in here, here in a second. And three is authenticity, which is also wrapped up in agency. So, Jay, do you want to talk about those two? So, when we look at the athlete agency initially, actually, the teams handled that media conversation with athletes, right? So, there was always that individual in between filtering that relationship. And in that sense, athletes were in a way control and who had access was control. But with the digitization of lives, actually athletes have direct access to the audience, and that is a two-way conversation. And when you think about that, with the popularity, they actually can put up their own personal brand and what they value in the front of their communication. So it's certainly generating a um, persona and a personal brand for the women athletes, and they have always been outspoken on the matters important to them. They have been very involved in their community, and they are certainly supporting causes. So when you look at some of the examples, we certainly remember Megan Rubino being the face of um, racial injustice in many ways, even before COVID. We've seen Naomi Osaka uh, playing a role in racial injustice as well, wearing the different masks, showing up the US Open and bringing those names to light, trying to get more attention and bring society behind it, right? We've seen US Women's National Team playing the face of pay equity, and they did succeed. And that will have a spur of impact in the society, not just in women's sport, right? So these are showcasing athletes have the agency to drive change and be the face of that. And we certainly see women are and have always been in this position. And they are outspoken, not hesitant, and we can find kind of examples for you to address that. And that relates greatly to the authenticity. Yeah, and I think the key point with female athlete agency is that because they've been largely ignored by traditional media, they are very good and that self ambassadors and they have to market and promote and build their own brand because media wasn't covering them. So what we find is not only are the female athletes their own 
agents, but that the fans of women's sport, because traditional media has largely ignored it, the fans of women's sport are also digital natives and are really good at finding the content because you it's not like you turn on the TV and like there's 18 channels of men's sport and axe throwing. Um, do you ever see that? Is that okay? Or cornhole. We had a good conversation about that last night. Is that a sport? Is that a game? That's a different panel. However, um, because you can't just turn on the TV and it's right there, the fans of women's sport have to go and find it. Yeah, and I, I, I'm curious, um, in your conversations about the myths around women's sport or what you know about women's sport, did you kind of bring up the fact that a female athlete needs to be sexy to get covered in media or to get attention? Cool. Yeah. It is, yeah, so I, that's another place where, you know, we're trying to debunk the truth. Yes, there are female athletes who choose to be sexualized. A former Aces player, Liz Cambage, is very, very good at it, um, which is good. She's no longer playing in the WNBA, so she needs someone to make money. But um, it's her choice, right? That's her authentic presentation of herself. Um, in comparison, other athletes now, including those on pain and shortness field, which are young, so let's hope they don't go that path, but they could, um, they get to present themselves based on their values, right? What matters to them? If they care about the environment, then they can get, you know, sponsors that are in that space. Or if they want to be someone who is very concerned about other social justice issues, right? They can say get Ally Financial behind them because Ally is, is one of the sponsors we're going to talk about in a minute um, who has made a pledge to women's sport. Okay, so that authenticity piece is really important, as is the fact that they have control over their image. One of the things you need to understand about the sexualization of women athletes that absolutely did occur and, and continues to occur. Advertising agencies still believe that sexualizing a female is the only way to get them interest. But the, the truth of that is female athletes have the control now, right? So they get to decide what goes out there that is representing me and my brand and who I am. That is a real game changer in this space. Yeah, and I think we do have data. So one of the studies that I have done with a colleague, Dr. Mary Jo Kane, is we would hear the narrative over and over, well, you know, to market and promote women's sport, you have to, it, they have to be sexy and pretty and feminine and hyper heterosexual, okay? And we said, do we, do we know that? Or is that just an opinion? And so we did a study and here's the key finding. Sex sells sex. Sex does not sell women's sport writ large. Now, being a sexy female athlete is good for that athlete, Liz Cambage, or you know, you're on the cover of whatever, out of uniform, not in action, off the court. That's how you can code this. You want to sort of like from now on, when you see images of female athletes, ask yourself, are they in action on the court and in their uniform? Okay, because that means I'm a serious athlete, but most of the images are not. And so sex doesn't sell women's sport. It doesn't increase the interest in and respect for women's sport. It might make a female athlete money, but it doesn't sustain and grow women's sport. And part of this authenticity piece is, yes, we would never want to tell female athletes, you know, don't Try to make money within a system where you don't make a lot of money. So they're making these choices to sexualize themselves in a system where women's sport is not valued. Okay, so they have the agency to portray themselves any way they want. But what we are finding with the authenticity piece is brands that not only do fans of women's sport want authentic female athlete representation. But the brands that are signing on to promote and represent women's sport, if they're not authentically doing that, there's, there is a fear in the industry of those brands being canceled. Because you can always tell, right? Is that performative, racial, Social justice is do you really care about the LGBT community or are you just going to slap a rainbow up there and pat yourself on the back 
or do you really support women? And so if it's not authentic, we as consumers know that and fans of women's sport will sniff that out. And that is a problem for those brands that are not authentic supporting. But if they are, that's good. And brands are starting to realize that. Yeah, so the, the sponsorship side, I did. I know. Um, before we get on to the sponsorship piece, I do want to reiterate, yes, um, presenting themselves if they choose to and sexualize themselves as such may bring emotional deals to some of the athletes, but we are also seeing it's not a requirement. If you are not sexualizing yourself and portraying yourself as a feminine, you still can make millions of dollars. Look at Megan Rapino, and yes, you can, right? So he has, she has been authentic. She put herself out there the way with her values and beliefs. She probably was hated by some, but the brand still stick with her, right? So she did not have to present herself as something she's not. And she can still portray herself with her full authenticity and make millions of dollars. And those endorsement deals stay with her. So I think that's one of the things that we're realizing in the history of the sport industry, women athletes were told that they needed to hide their sexuality. They were told to dress in a certain way. I'm not going to say this too, although it's kind of recording. Um, WNBA actually gave their athletes makeup lessons in the history, right? So that was yeah, and tagline, was, basketball is pretty, was that one of their taglines for a season. I don't know what year it was, but that was a thing. Right? So that is what you were told by an organization that this is the way you can make an earning. But with the change in the industry, they do have the power, they, they have the agency, and they can make those decisions to be authentic and present themselves as they are. And that still yields the most Yeah, so, you know, that's, that gets into my space where um, one of the things, again, that we have data to verify is in a sponsorship space. So endorsements, you know, is, is basically a sponsorship of an individual athlete where the athlete has a relationship with the brand. Um, representing the brand, but a sponsorship is the bigger deal with the league or getting into, you know, sponsoring a specific team. Um, you all are familiar with sponsorships because every time you watch any sporting event, you see their signage around the arena, right? That's the easiest example of what sponsorship is. And now, of course, we can we have virtual signage, so it changes as you're watching the game. Yes. There's opportunity for even more of that kind of visibility. And the visibility itself is one of the most important pieces for these brands because they're trying to get you to a place where you recognize, right? And even perhaps recall the name of the brand in association with the team, the athlete, or the league. That is that is the goal of sponsorship, right? Like so tonight, Golden Knights playing at five o'clock, you will see uh, a number of brands and I could probably name several of them for you. Um, and that that is a direct goal of theirs, right? It's the Stanley Cup. It's the Golden Knights. They want that halo effect, right, from the team to rub off on their brand. That's why they do it, okay? So, yeah, you will see that. You've seen it. You maybe never really noticed it before, but clearly it's very effective when they would be keep pouring millions and millions of dollars into this, this approach, right? The interesting thing, again, on the women's sports side is 1% of sponsorship dollars, 1% have been spent on women's sport, right? So when I told you about that cycle and mentioned how it breaks down, and we have data to demonstrate the cycle has broken down, it doesn't work. That's why this new model has emerged. The new model, what sponsorship looks like now is very different than what sponsorship has looked like historically. So in mind, I've been doing this a very long time, very, very long time. I did the first study on sponsorship of women's sport back in the 90s, right? Back when um, actually Nike for the very first time decided to sponsor the National Women's Soccer League and to take them on tour so that they could actually train and compete on an international level the very first time. Um, and so who else was sponsoring women's sport back then? Virginia Slims, thank God we had them. A cigarette company, right? A cigarette company. A long way, baby. Yeah. 
who wanted to market to women through, thank goodness, they're the ones that were the benefactors that you could But otherwise, who was it? Tampax, right? The kind of thinking was the only women's products were the only kinds of, of brands that could get involved in sponsorship of women's sports, something beauty related, perhaps, right? Well, guess what? Women are responsible for 80% of the household decisions. Household decisions. So why isn't it State Farm? Why isn't it Geico? Why isn't it Bank of America, right? Why isn't it the big category sponsors, the financials, the insurance, the autos, all of those? Women buy cars. I know, rock the world right now. My God. So that's what's happening though, that's, that's shifting, right? So I mentioned Ally Financial before. Ally committed this year that 50% of their sport sponsorship money will be spent on women's sport, 50% obviously on men's sport. So is that going to hurt men's sport? Not, not a bit, not a bit. Is it gonna help women's sport? Tremendously. And what have they done? They've basically thrown the, the challenge out there to all other companies and said, we're doing this, what do you do, right? Imagine what a change that is to go from 1% to 10, 20, to 50. That's a game changer right there, right? If women's, women's sport had that percentage of sponsorship dollars going into it. True. <laughs> okay, so... Whatever you were talking about at your table around false narratives, I heard a false narrative yesterday that's not related to women's sport, but here's an example. And I can't remember who said it, but I wrote it down. The false narrative is that the NFL is broke. <laughs> right? And if that's true, I'm going down to the strip and putting a bet down on it. But, um, and I would lose. So, there's a lot of false narratives in women's sport, and we don't want to repeat those. So we're going to give you some new narratives, and I would invite you to write these down and repeat them when people give you the false narratives. So here's one, and this is a good summary. Interest in women's sport is measurable and growing faster than men's sport. That is true. Viewership's going up, attendance is going up. Ticket sales in women's sports are growing seven times faster than in men's sports. Data tells the story. Data tells the story. So we saw that during COVID, right? When the um, Women's Professional Soccer League, the NWSL was the first one back to be live on TV. It was also that summer, everything got compressed. So you have the NBA, the NHL, the w, NWSL, football was starting, college football was starting, and the NWSL still had the highest viewer rates. Not just because it was the only thing to do, there was a lot of other choices consumers could make. But what we know is that interest in women's sport is growing, and there's a return on investment that is far greater than the investment in men's sport. That's the narrative. Yeah, and that, that particular case is really important to look at because that the place where consumers were accessing NWSL during that time was Twitch. You all know what Twitch is? It's where gamers go, right, to esports. It's where they go to watch competitive esports. So it wasn't like they were on mainstream linear and access was easy. That demonstrates very profoundly what we are saying about the new model, how these new consumers have had to learn to access the sport that they want, women's sport, and they're really good at it now. They find it and they share it with each other and the numbers bear that out. So some of those that was just shared is from 2020-21, but I'll tell you a few numbers from this season for NWSL, National Women's Soccer League, and WNBA and some European football. Um, so I can tell you the WNBA opening weekend attendance jumped 24%. Uh, looking at Liberty reported 200% year over year increase in ticket sales or season ticket memberships. Uh, we are certainly seeing San Diego Wave attracting 30,000 plus attendees regularly. Yes, I love your face. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. 
but they are not singled out. So I'm going to tell you that Arsenal women's team sold out Emirates Stadium, referring to 60,000 plus attendees. And I'm going to also tell you that England women's FA Cup and Wembley Stadium sold out. Do we know the capacity of Wembley Stadium? 90,000 plus, right? So we're not giving you singled out, isolated examples. If you look at Spain, if you look at Germany, you're going to see and find the same outcomes. So it is evidence and it is real parent and it is keep coming in front of the business decision makers, media decision makers, and hopefully it's continuing to push the narrative. Yeah, and I will just say I was recently in Barcelona and then got to see um, the Barcelona women play Chelsea in Camp Nou, which was 80,000 people. And it was packed, it was sold out. And it was amazing to see that um, as a consumer in the European market, because we hear about it, but to be there and, and experience it was really something else. I wanna say one more, one more data point. And I think this is incredible. And I, I hope this prompts everyone to think a little harder and longer. Um, <clears throat> and see women's basketball final four through just close to 10 million viewers and peaked at 12.6 million. And I'm gonna tell you, NBA finals that are ongoing right now, peaks at 12.7 million. 12.6, 12.7, we're at the same number. And how much NBA is targeting for their next media rights deals? $75 billion. And when does it come to NCAA women's basketball? It's still sold underneath the umbrella of men's final four. And ESPN bought the rights to 20 women's sport, 20 women's college sports championships under one umbrella for $34 million for 20 women's championships. And then we wonder why women's sport isn't making money is because they're not selling the rights to each championships separately like they do the men. So when the women's final four March Madness rights are coming up soon, I think it's in 2024, um, they're projecting that the women's basketball championships alone will sell for a hundred million dollars. Yeah, but hundred million dollars, but what you just heard from Jada is 75 billion billion. Or the NBA, yeah. right? We have similar numbers, but add four zeros. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, you see that that there is much work to be done, and that's why we're trying to debunk the myths because that goes right back directly to this notion that nobody's interested in women's sports, that there's not an audience, right? That there, there's no way for sponsors and companies to recoup the investment that they make. That's what has been said over and over and over again. And what we're telling and showing through this data is all of that is a false narrative. The return on investment, the o ROI, is higher in women's sport. Those that are kind of in the know right now, and there are plenty of them out there now, are saying, you may have already missed the train. Like, you need to get on this train right now if you're a sponsor, if you're a media um, company, and you need to invest in women's sport because it is growing exponentially much faster than anything else. Um, one of the things that uh, another one of our big myths, the, the piece that has happened historically around women's sport, and one of the reasons that the value has been suppressed is that we rely very heavily on gender equity, Title IX, and it's the right thing to do, right? The morally right thing to do was to invest in women's sport. And there's no question that that's true, right? It matters for girls to see women competing at a high level. It matters for boys to see women competing at a high level. It matters, right? There is no question that that is a moral imperative for help us, helping us to create a more egalitarian society, but we can't use that narrative. That narrative alone will not get investment. That narrative alone shows no economic value. So what we're trying to do is change that narrative to say there is value there is opportunity, there is return on investment in women's sport that eclipses other opportunities. Oh, and by the way, it's the right thing to do. 
right? So that's the added value piece now. And that's another really pretty critical um, finding and myth buster that we like to bring to the table. You want to share another one, Jalen? I think one of the big pieces is the media part, right? So we certainly talked about um, having the streaming services and adding coverage into those. Uh, but we also need to recognize how challenging it has been for women's sport fans to find content, right? So um, we are women's sport fans, and I personally can say that I have the look, I used to have to look all around to find a little bit of information. And where I found myself was fan communities on social media where people like us trying to generate some content for each other and share the tidbits that someone may have heard somewhere, right? Um, so directly accessible information, discoverability of women's sports wasn't really there. But when we look here today, we've seen just women's sports, the just, um, there is the new women's sport network that covers women's sports alone 24 seven, right? So those have emerged out of the demand the consumers have that we have proved with the numbers in the last 15, 20 years, right? I think those are extremely important to have. And I will say, you know, if you're a sport fan, you probably watch, at least in the US, ESPN, right? How many people have consumed ESPN on digital, linear, social? Okay. So ESPN is our, they call themselves the worldwide leader in sport coverage. That I guess might be true. However, ESPN is a really good case study because they're the ones that are showing the most coverage of women's sport. And it's this idea that they found if you build it, they will come, right? So they are showing more women's sport with higher production value with great commentators that create excitement and drama which gets people interested. And guess what's happening to viewership of women's sport on those on ESPN? It's going up. So now the cycle is reversing because they've shown women's sport with high production value. They've shown their interest. And guess what now? Sponsors are coming on board. Allies is committed, I don't know what the figure is, a lot of money to increase the percentage of women's sport that are being broadcast because they know it's a good business proposition. They're not doing it because it's the right thing to do. They're doing it because they can make money. And right, that's that's what's going to keep driving this new cycle and this new model for women's sport. Yeah, and another really good example, um, Google became a sponsor of the WNBA in the last year. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they pledged, in addition to just money, right? So. We talked about the fact that authenticity matters. Um, it matters with the sponsors just as much as it matters with the athletes. So sponsors that sign up that just want to do it for like a performative thing, like, oh, look, I'm a WNBA sponsor, not going to work. You got to be all in, right? You really have to support what um, resonates with the fans. So Google discovered that their own algorithms would only, if you asked the question, like who is the greatest basketball player of all time, it would only show you male athletes their own algorithms, right? And so they started to look at this and say, um, we need to change what we do. We need to change discoverability. So now if you ask Google, who is the best tennis player of all time, you should have a number of women, right? Serena, hello, um, in the list with a number of men. Um, and that's significant. That is not a small thing. That is how you as a company, Google, show that you are truly in, you truly care, you're making changes to your business practices to approve this entire ecosystem for women's sport, right? So it's not just Ally, it's not just Google, there's a number of other important sponsors that are doing meaningful work. Anybody seen a CarMax ad lately? Did you see a CarMax ad lately? Candace Parker, can we talk about Candace Parker? <laughs> yeah, Candace, Candace is, is getting some good sponsorship deals and so is Bird. And the nice thing is you still see them having a conversation 
All right, wisdom. Right. So, you know, it's it's like normalizing this idea that women athletes are just like male athletes and we're going to bring them into the, the sponsorship mix. You're, that is that is a game changer, right? I mean, I recall um, John Quill Jones as well in the state farm commercial last year with a couple of the NBA athletes. And I've been looking at, for that for a long time. I'm thinking, man, I pay state farm a lot of money and all I ever see is male athletes. Right, representing state farm. So it's nice to start seeing some women athletes as well. These are these are game changers. They might seem like just small, not a big deal, but they're changing our culture in ways that we're seeing these women athletes and starting to know them. Right. In the last five years, I think a lot of people would be hard pressed to name a WNBA athlete. Right. But now we can name some WNBA athletes because we see them beyond the court. Right. They're in the whole culture, not just in the sport culture. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that, that I'd love everyone to think about is women's sport historically has had to prove their value. So if we're going to show you, show us interest, show us return on investment, show us the value proposition. The flip side of that is we don't ask that of men's sport properties. So I would like us to shift that narrative. Like, if we're going to ask that of women's sport, let's be consistent and let's see the value proposition for men's sport. Because I'm not sure people are having that conversation, but there are high level people in the industry that are trying to flip that script internally to say, Oh, well, if we're going to do a million dollar spend on the NFL, what's our value proposition of that? What are we getting back versus we're going to spend one million dollars on the NWSL? Are we going to get, you know, so let's make the argument parallel. And that is not currently happening, but it's starting to happen within the industry as they're realizing that the value prop for women's sport is much greater. Yeah, and, and, and part of that also is another one of the significant changes that's been occurring that is not as visible, except for every now and then we hear about the latest pioneer, the latest woman who is, you know, um, coaching in Major League Baseball or who's coaching in the NFL. We tend to not hear, although in Las Vegas we heard of it recently, uh, the president of the Las Vegas Raiders is a woman. In fact, she's the first black woman to be the president of an NFL team. So we're very proud of Sandra um, Douglas, who is is a UNLV grad as well. So there's that. Um, you know Candace Parker. <laughs> they know each other now. Yeah, they do. Um, so, but the point being, these decisions, right? The decisions on where to spend money have always been at the highest level, right? And that means predominantly men making those decisions. Now, I'm not saying women would always make the decision to invest in women's sport because that's not necessarily true, but at least getting the education, right, of these people, and mostly a lot of women too, to say, let's look at the value proposition. Let's have that conversation. A lot of us in sport marketing know for a fact that some of these big sponsorship deals are about the CEO being able to rub elbows on a golf course with other really high profile people. That is not a value proposition. Now, he might argue with you that it is because that's how he gets access to do other business and that's fine, but can we measure it? Where's the data, right? And that's what we're saying now because always that was thrown in our face. Where's the data to support women's sport? Well, we have the data now, right? We have the data, we're happy to make the value proposition, but let's see the value proposition on the other side as well. Right, and let's help get it, get more of our women into those leadership positions where they get to help make those decisions or get to make those decisions. Right, mm -hmm. and I think that what Nancy's saying is there's you know one of these common narratives, and I hate to say it out loud, but I will related to men in positions of power is that well, what we've heard for decades is nobody's interested in women's sport. Nobody's interested, which is absolutely false. Um, but what we can say is that when people say that, men in positions of power, no one's interested in women's sport, what they mean is they aren't interested in women's sport. 
and they are the ones making the decision. So we're trying to change that narrative with data because what I've learned, why I say let data tell the story, is data is the language of men in positions of power. And if you can make the case, it's not like, well, Nicole LaVoy, the director of the Tucker Center, feels really strongly that we should show more women's sports. They don't give us that. Okay. They do care about the data that aligns with business. I think we have demonstrated plenty of evidence, database evidence, that there is interest. And we will call you all to have or make some action or take action alongside with us. Um, we would hope you guys would join us to watch some women's sport in person or on TV, impacting obviously additional data points uh, moving forward and getting on board and supporting something uh, that has a great trajectory and deserves to be accessible. Yeah, we have several calls to action. So watch women's sport. Um, Aces are on today at four o'clock playing Connecticut. If you want to watch, you can watch on Fox 5 Local, which I'm very happy to see that they'll be covering it. <laughs> and the Women's College World Series, if you're a softball fan, is on ESPN, I think at four or five. Okay. So record them both so you can watch them both. Um, that's what we do. Yeah, we do. Um, call out media outlets that neglect covering women's sport. I'm pretty commonly doing this. Um, and, you know, it matters. Uh, this year, our women's basketball team here at UNLV went on a winning streak. I don't know what it ended at, 20 some odd games. But at 10 games, I had to reach out to Twitter and say, hey, Review Journal, have you noticed that at 10 games is a pretty significant winning streak? And all you're doing is talking about our men's team who's losing. Could we start paying attention, right? I mean, these things matter. This is what men have done, by the way, for years. This is why it's sports editors who also tend to be men will tell you that uh, they're covering what people are interested in. Because if we don't cover the Golden Knights, people will throw a fit, right? And by people, I mean mostly men, right? So we, as women sport fans, which by the way, 50% of women sport fans are men. 50% of women sport fans are men. So we have to be just as active in saying to the media, we want to see coverage of women's sport. It matters. Okay, we're getting the time on the tap on the watch in the back. So um, watch women's sport, call out media, buy merchandise, complain when you don't get merchandise, and talk to friends, take your friends, family, kids, follow on social media and distribute and be an ally. And lastly, don't perpetuate myths. If you hear a myth, you now have the data, the report, if you go to the next slide, Samantha, um, the report is accessible, or you could just go to the Tucker Center website, but we have a QR code so that you can actually download our whole, um, it's a white paper, it's not, um, and that's for a reason. We also want to make it accessible to a wide audience. I should have left it to the experts. So um, lots of ways that you can get invested, involved, support, advocate for women's sport, and your voice matters. So thank you. Time for questions or not? We have, uh, well, we can do this on. We have, we have 15 minutes for coffee, questions, and meeting back to the room. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, we can take some questions and grab some coffee at the same time. Yeah. Yeah.